Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Malta Dorber, who's going to talk today about using compression for high bandwidth video. Malta, we have 8K video coming in. We've got a lot more cameras. We have a lot more devices taking advantage of the bandwidth. Without ripping out all of the infrastructure that's there, how do we get more out of that bandwidth? That's a very good question. What we see really now in 2019 is that, yeah, as you said, higher resolution products come to the market like DTV, uh, 8K is in mass production in 2019. We see next year in the Japan Olympics there will be um, 8K broadcasting uh, coming to the market. So consumers uh, seem to demand uh, higher and higher resolutions and higher refresh uh, frequencies for applications like, for example, gaming, uh, where 240 hertz becomes um, uh, is a standard. So what this requires is, of course, higher and higher bandwidth. Uh, we have seen uh, the latest interface standards like HDMI 2.1 providing up to 48 gigabit per second, which is quite bandwidth to work with. But nevertheless, the demands from the consumers are increasing. So one way to deal with that is to use compression on the link between the source device and the uh, uh, display device. In the past, when we've done compression, it, you, you sacrifice quality quite a bit. Has that changed? Yeah, so today we're going to talk about a standard that seems uh, being widely adapted in the industry. It has been announced by VESA, uh, it's called uh, Display Stream Compression, DSC. It has been around for a couple of years, uh, very prominent in the mobile market with uh, MIPI DSi. But now we see adoption also in um, cable connections like HDMI 2.1 is supporting it, DisplayPort 1.4 is supporting that. So the industry overall is moving to a common compression standard. Yeah, so, so one, one key factor of compression is to provide a compression standard that is uh, not um, sacrificing the quality of the image. So display stream compression um, is uh, what is called visual lossless. It's not mathematical lossless. So you're going to reduce uh, the data, but uh, you're doing it in a way that the human eye is not being able to see that. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is exactly the link that connects the source device with the display. Um, the link that could be an HDMI connection or an embedded connection in form from MIPI. Um, the compression that happens here in, in case of DSC, as I said, is visual lossless. But also another property factor is that it's very important that you're able to uh, decode and encode the data in real time because you have a continuous stream of data coming in. So how do you do this? What, what are, what, what's the basis for making this work? Yeah, so we see two use forms of uh, utilizing this in the industry. One is uh, very uh, prominent in the area of mobile devices where you want to save resources and you can use compression to make the, uh, make the link uh, more compact, saving area, power, and uh, EMI, and reducing EMI. So that's the typically uh, MIPI use case. The second use case is to kind of future-proof the current bandwidth requirement by using compression to go beyond what the current interface standard is supporting. And this is what you see in the form of a cable connection. So that's uh, the use case for HDMI and display link. Does it take a lot of power to compress and decompress this data? Uh, that's a very important point to make this efficient and make this work, is to not uh, uh, use a lot of uh, power and have a very Im efficient implementation. So. Um, DSC allows to for very efficient hardware implementation uh, with minimal area size, with mi minimal memory requirements and uh, power consumption. Because some of this is not just going to be devices with a plug, right? Some of this will be done on a, uh, a smartphone where you're watching video. Exactly. So one of the strongholds of DSC compression is um, mobile devices and uh, use, utilizing uh, MIPI DSi. So let me show you one example on uh, how you're able to save area and power. So how do we get there? What, what, what do we have to do? Right, so let me show you an example, um, a mobile example of uh, a device that uh, wants to display ultra high definition video. Uh, that's a 4K resolution and it requires a 60 frame per second or so on 40.3 gigabit per second. Um, so I'm going to show you now what kind of uh, IP and what kind of area you need to um, consume on your, on your chip to do that. So of course you need an, um, a MIPI uh, DSi controller and a DeFi 1.2. A DeFi 1.2 gives you per lane around uh, 2.5 gigabit per second. So if you divide those two numbers, you s uh, easily see that you're going to use around um, six lanes uh, to transmit the data from uh, your source to the display. So now if you're using uh, DSC components in here to do some compression, data compression, 
you are able to compress the data by a factor of three. This means that you are able to reduce the amount of lane requirements from six to two. So you're able to save four of the lanes. So if you go from six to two lanes. This allows you to save significant area on your file and the controller logic for handling less file lanes. So uh, overall, the benefit of saving area uh, also is directly related to saving power, which is uh, more beneficial than adding the DSC block. And also reduces heat along the way too, because you're, you're, you have less logic working all the time, right? Exactly, uh, reducing heat, uh, reducing um, t EMI that comes through the additional lanes that you have on the ship. So these are all the benefits that you get and are very important for mobile devices. So how does this actually benefit cable connections? Well, good question. Here I have another example um, where you have an HDMI 2.1 connection, a file that is able to um, transmit 48 gigabit per second. With HDMI 2.1, you have uh, a fixed number of lanes, four lanes, and you also need a controller in before. And what you're able to do with HDMI 2.1 is to achieve 8K60, for example, as a resolution. And you see in 2019 products out in the market that are going to do that. So what if you uh, now add a DSC um, encoder in here as well, you're able to increase um, the bandwidth um, that you're able to transmit over the lanes by compression. Again, a factor of three to one. And you're able to do use cases that you are not able to physically do over the, uh, the wired connection, like for example, 10K, 60, or um, 4K, 240, which might be at some point interesting for gaming applications. So these are some fairly substantial changes in resolution. As a matter of fact, we probably haven't seen this kind of uh, uh, resolution jump in years. What does the system look like? Yeah, you're right. This is a very complex system. I try to uh, show a little bit here what the challenges are. So here you see an, an, an example of an HDMI 2.1 uh, system with the different components that are needed uh, to achieve uh, DC uh, stream compression. So let me go through the blocks one by one. So you have uh, the DC encoder block, so the data comes in, um, the DC encoder block, then there's an HDMI controller that's hand handling the HDMI packaging. And you have the HDMI 2.1 uh, compliant file that allows you to transmit data up to 48 gigabit per second. What is also important is, of course, an HTCP uh, content protection uh, for HDMI is required. And as you connect here over a physical uh, cable uh, to um, an RX uh, television, for example, you will have a similar structure of uh, mirrored components like a FI, a controller, and uh, an encoder on that side as well. So you see quite a complex number of blocks that all need to work together smoothly. What does this do on the design side? Is this a, a complex thing to work with, or is it just another standard that you plug into whatever you're working with? Yeah, so um, there's some design challenges con connected to that. Uh, as I said, you need to make sure that those components are communicating with each other correctly. One of the challenges is, of course, in cable connection that you never know what you're connecting to. So in the beginning of the connection setup, uh, the devices need to talk about uh, what they're able to uh, achieve, what kind of compression they both support. So uh, basically, the, the, the RX side is sending uh, information over to the HDMI controller about the capabilities that it supports. And then the software that is running in the subsystem need to configure the different block correctly to support this configuration. One of the big challenges as you get into compression is bringing it back to a state where it's decompressed. You've, you're basically splitting up the signal, right? Right. To achieve one of the requirements, uh, real-time um, compliance, uh, you need to be able to uh, work on very huge images in, in, in real time. And uh, that was a reasonable amount of clock speed. So the only way to do that, and DSC as an algorithm allows uh, for very efficient uh, parallelization. So what you're basically going to do and what is prescribed in the standard is that you can uh, slice your image into vertical slices, uh, depending on uh, the size of the image and the clock speed of your design. And how do you get those pieces back together? Right, so let me first explain that this is one of the configuration parameters that is uh, handshake between the source and the sync side. So let's assume we have uh, an 8K image and we slice it into two slices, like I have shown here. Uh, so what's happening that uh, as the image data comes in uh, line by line, it's filling up, the data is written into buffers. And uh, once the first uh, kind of uh, tile here is, uh, is, is written, is uh, completed, it's been processed by the first encoder uh, slice uh, engine. And as the data for the second slice comes in, it's being decoded or encoded by the uh, parallel engine 
uh, on that side as well. So this is then uh, worked in parallel on, and by that you're able to, to reduce the clock speed, and then you're sending it out to the source um, in, in those uh, buckets of um, uh, slices. That's traditionally been one of the hardest problems that engineers have had to solve, right, is bringing data back together in a cohesive way without uh, enormous amounts of power and performance loss. Right. Uh, because this is a very uh, dynamic system, you are able to handle different situations. The re resolution can change on the way. So you need to be able to uh, figure out what a kind of uh, slicing has happened, what kind of uh, resolution has happened. You might fill in uh, padding data that need to be reconstructed on the sync side as well. So uh, there's a lot of um, smartness uh, in the details here, uh, including uh, reconstruction of the sync signals uh, to, to drive the display. When does all this start going into effect? You mentioned the 2020 Olympics. When do we start seeing it in consumer devices? Yeah, so depending on uh, the segment, like I said, for mobile devices, we already seen uh, this way, way um, actively being used. For uh, televisions, like the 8K televisions, it's becoming a standard requirement to, to be support, to be uh, future compliant with all kind of uh, source devices that are going to come out. Other markets as well? Will it start be showing up in uh, automotive, for example, or any of those other markets? Right. So um, all kind of markets that uh, sit somewhere in between needing high resolution and saving power, like automotive, for example, can benefit uh, from this by reducing the amount of, uh, of wires, still being able to transmit very high resolution over given channels. Malta Dorper, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much.